on camera quickly and introduce yourself, and then we'll follow that with uh, Laura and Weston and Benja uh, doing likewise. Over to you, Andy. Hi, Jim, and hi, everybody. Thanks. Um, I'm Andy Coyle. I work for the NOAA Physical Sciences Laboratory in Boulder, and my team researches the processes and predictability and prediction, sometimes projections of hydroclimatic extremes, and that information is used to provide outlooks for drought and food security. Thank you. All right. Andy, thank you. Laura. Hello, I am Laura Harrison with the UC Santa Barbara Climate Hazard Center. I provide information to the FuseNet science team and the GeoGlam crop monitors. My areas of focus are evaluation and communication of developing and forecast seasonal climate related concerns, as well as exploratory analysis on historical drivers of high impact events and opportunities for earlier early warning. And I'm very pleased to be speaking with you all today. Thanks, Laura. Weston, over to you. Thanks, Jim. Um, my name is Weston Anderson. I'm with the University of Maryland and the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. I work on climate variability and how it affects crop yields primarily um, and how we can use that information to build uh, better informed systems and crop yield predictions. Thank you, Weston and Benja. Hi everyone, my name is Benjamin Davies, also go by Benja. I'm a senior food security analyst uh, with the FuseNet early warning team as part of the decision support group. Um, I cover primarily Eastern and Southern Africa and I also serve as the regional lead for Southern Africa. All right. Thanks very much. Um, as mentioned, this is being recorded. Um, if you have questions or comments that occur to you uh, in the course of the presentations, please uh, feel free to put them in the chat box or save them until the end. Um, we will do Q&A um, after all the presentations are done um, and the recording is turned off. And so with that, I'd like to go to our first presenter, Andy, who will uh, talk about uh, El Nino and what it is and, and what this particular event looks like. Um, 2023, 2024, um, and then he will uh, pass on to uh, Laura to go over anomalies in rainfall that we expect, and Weston for anomalies in crop yields around the world, and then the fourth presenter will be Benja, who will talk about implications for food insecurity in areas covered by FuseNet. So um, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to you, Andy. All right, thank you very much, Jim. And again, thanks for joining us, everyone. So what I'm going to talk about today are three real three topics. The first is the El Nino Southern Oscillation. What is it and how does it come about? And the second are relevant El Nino characteristics that are important to regional climate prediction and what we should expect going forward. And then finally, the forecast. Uh, the ongoing El Nino, it's most likely to be strong and just highlighting some of those salient features and to serve up uh, what Laura and uh, Benja and Weston will talk about. So I'll begin with the El Nino Southern Oscillation and a brief description of what it is. So the El Nino, El Nino Southern Oscillation is a coupled atmosphere ocean phenomena in the tropical Pacific Ocean, and it's really comprised of two components. One is in the ocean, the El Nino component. And the second is the Southern Oscillation component, which is really the atmospheric component. It consists of three phases, the first being Enso neutral, the second being La Nina, and the third being El Nino. El Nino, of course, really our principal focus today just because of the ongoing event and what it's forecast to turn out to be. Now, what I'm gonna show here are some, uh, some schematics that show the three-dimensional picture in the atmosphere and ocean that are relevant to the El Nino Southern Oscillation. During ENSO neutral conditions, which are generally average conditions, what we see in the, in the tropical Pacific Ocean are easterly winds. Um, can't see the presentation. Um, can others see the presentation? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. I'll keep going. So with ENSO neutral conditions, what we see are easterly winds. So winds blowing from the east to the west, 
that move warm water that are as at the surface to the Western Pacific Ocean. And what that also does is it encourages water at depth to come to the surface, cool water at depth. So this is the reason why the Western Pacific is warmer than the Eastern Pacific Ocean. Now, related to that are atmospheric circulations um, in near the surface and also at the top of the atmosphere. And you can see that here in the diagram. These atmospheric circulations are called the Walker circulations, very important to the dynamics of the Earth system. And basically, we see increased precipitation in the Western Pacific compared to that of the Eastern Pacific. Now, when it comes to La Nina events, where we've been for the last few years, it's really an intensification of conditions that are relevant to like ENSO neutral. So what happens is those easterly winds in the tropical Pacific Ocean, they're much stronger than they ordinarily are. And that causes for that warm water buildup in the West Pacific to become that much more intense. So the Western Pacific gets warmer, but it also encourages cooler water in the Central and Eastern Pacific Ocean to surface, thereby causing cooler the normal conditions in Eastern Pacific and warmer than normal conditions in the Western Pacific. Now also related to that is an atmospheric circulation component, which encourages more precipitation in the Western Pacific Ocean and less precipitation in the Central Tropical Pacific Ocean. Now really for El Nino, El Nino is, is in some ways a reversal of Enso Neutral and certainly that of La Nina where the easterly winds in the tropical Pacific Ocean become quite a bit weaker. And as a result of that, it does not push that warm surface water that in, from the central Pacific Ocean to the western Pacific Ocean. And as a result of that, we tend to see anomalously warm sea surface temperatures in the central tropical Pacific Ocean and also the eastern tropical Pacific Ocean as well. What that also does is it creates anomalous atmospheric circulations in the tropics and anomalous precipitation in the tropics, which then set off a cascading impact of climate anomalies elsewhere within the Earth system. And that right there is going to be the focus of what Lara and Weston and Benjamin will talk about. Now, looking at this from a slightly different perspective, we tend to look at uh, the sea surface temperatures in the Pacific Ocean during El Nino and La Nina events in terms of anomalies. That is a departure from average. So you're, you may, some of you may be very familiar with a map like this where it shows sea surface temperature anomalies during El Nino where we get these warmer colors indicating above average sea surface temperatures in the Central Pacific Ocean and the Eastern Pacific Ocean. Also related to that, are changes in the atmospheric circulation. So the wind vectors here show just that, where we're seeing departures from average of winds, which are from the west, which means that we're getting anomalous winds from the west, which is related to the increases in sea surface temperatures in the tropical central Pacific Ocean. Now, moving on here to El Nino characteristics. These are key characteristics that we monitor and forecast because they're very relevant to the anomalous climate conditions elsewhere that we're interested in. Those happen to be intensity and flavor. Now, one thing and perhaps the most important thing to consider about El Nino events and their impacts is no two El Nino events are the same. And they are characterized by sea surface temperature anomaly departures as intensity and then their location of those departures, which we call the flavor. Now, this is where we get kind of interactive here. These are three sea surface temperature anomaly maps for El Nino events. And you can see that they're all very different to illustrate the point as to the differences between those events. Now, if anybody is um, uh, brave enough to write in the chat what they think the left one is, go right ahead. I'll give you five seconds. The one on the left is a strong El Nino, of course, and it is 1997-1998 El Nino. The middle one is the 2004-2005 El Nino, which is obviously very weak. And the one on the right is from 2009 to 2010. Now, if we were to characterize these, what we would say is the intensity of the 97-98 El Nino was strong, and its flavor was that of the Eastern Pacific, as indicated by these very warm sea surface temperature anomalies in the Eastern Pacific Ocean. 
The 0405 event, you look at that and you're like, no, oh, this is barely an El Nino. Was this even meaningful? Well, it didn't meet the criteria according to the Climate Prediction Center. And as a result of that, what we're seeing is these very mild sea surface temperature anomalies in the central Pacific Ocean. So the intensity of this event was weak and it was a central Pacific El Nino. And then finally, the 0910 event, that was a moderate El Nino and its flavor was central Pacific as indicated by its sea surface temperature anomalies in the central Pacific Ocean. Now, finally, what I'm gonna talk about is the forecast. What are we anticipating for the ongoing El Nino event? And this is in its relevance, of course, to the climate anomalies elsewhere in the climate system. This chart right here shows the probability of El Nino in red, and so neutral in gray, and La Nina in blue, for three months seasons from June, July, and August, which is the season that we're currently in right now, all the way to February, March, and April. And as you can see, the probability of an El Nino event through the end of this year is greater than, than 93%. And even into early next year, we have an 85% chance of an El Nino event. Now, in terms of the strength of this El Nino, we anticipate it to be moderate to strong. And we measure this by the anomalous sea surface temperatures in the central and eastern Pacific Ocean. And these are forecasts that are produced by the NOAA Climate Prediction Center. So what they do is they assign probabilities of a weak, moderate, and strong El Nino event. And as you can see, for the three month season that we're currently in, a moderate El Nino is what we're anticipating. And then as we go into later in the year, there is a most likely outcome as indicated by probabilities of greater than 50% of a strong El Nino event. So this El Nino event right here is forecast to be moderate to strong for later in the year. And then another pr perspective here is using the North American Multimodal Ensemble, which is a forecast system that we use in the weather and climate community to make some judgments about conditions that we expect in the future. These sea surface temperature anomalies we see here from the North American Multimodal Ensemble for October, November, December, and this was made a couple weeks ago in July, is that of an Eastern Pacific El Nino event and one that is moderate to strong. And then finally, just to wrap up here, another question here, especially considering the multi-year La Nina event that we've, we've uh, currently come out of, is what's the likelihood that we'll have a multi-year El Nino event? And the answer to that, at least right now, is very low. So these are experimental probabilistic ENSO forecasts for three month seasons out to a few years from now. These are produced by the NOAA Physical Sciences Laboratory. And we see here that the probability of El Nino diminishes by the time we get into early next year, and that we don't have really much of a preferred El Nino ENSO neutral La Nina state going forward. We see a little bit higher probabilities of La Nina, but this is uh, within sampling. So there isn't much to that right now. And that will wrap up my component of the presentation. So uh, Laura Harrison will now talk about precipitation and precipitation forecasts. Thanks, Andy. Next slide, please. This year, we are on watch for large impacts in El Nino teleconnection regions consistent with forcing from a moderate to strong El Nino event. We're looking to historical outcomes during past similar events, and if there is agreement from the latest dynamical model precipitation forecasts. Now there is a large range of outcomes during past El Nino events, and so there's a potential for non-typical impacts as well. Currently, there's been a weak level of atmospheric coupling in the tropical Pacific, but there's lots of opportunity for development a factor for this year is also the already very high global temperatures. This increases the chances of heat stress as well as extreme rainfall events in wet regions. Next. El Niños tend to enhance rainfall in Southern North America, parts of Southern South America, Southern Europe, Central Asia, Southeastern China, and in East Africa in Eastern and Southern areas. Drier than average conditions tend to occur in parts of North America, across Central America, the Southern Caribbean, Northern South America, parts of Northern China, India, Southeast Asia, the Maritime Continent, Australia, in East Africa and Western and Northern areas, 
occasionally in parts of the Sahel and across Southern Africa. Next, please. No previous strong El Nino has developed under such warm conditions, and this leaves the possibility for non-typical impacts as well as higher heat stress. Uh, we're currently at record high global temperatures, as shown here for July uh, temperatures uh, recently. Next slide, please. And models indicate that very high temperatures are expected to continue into 2024. These maps in red are showing where there are very high chances of 80th percentile or higher two meter temperatures during the next several months and into November to January. We are seeing this pattern across a lot of the tropics as well as in El Nino teleconnection regions. Next, please. Now, high temperatures can mean an increased thirst of the atmosphere uh, and higher evaporative demand, higher levels of evaporation that can dry out the soil, especially during dry spells, and this can exacerbate drying impacts. So we're looking at the past tendencies of higher temperatures as well as higher evaporative demand during moderate to strong El Ninos. Next, please. In particular, we are concerned with some of the drought hotspots during past moderate to strong El Ninos. These are areas of the globe that are shown in oranges and red in this map, where the incre the, there are increased chances of very below average precipitation between July and February. We're also addressing some other regions in more detail that FuseNet typically monitors. Starting with Central America, you can see here in this map that the Pacific regions, as well as the, as the Southern areas, do tend to have uh, very low precipitation during July to February um, in a number of moderate to strong El Nino events. Next slide, please. And this is a concern because the latest Primera growing season has had very poor rainfall conditions and persistent hot conditions as well. There was extremely low rainfall in many locations, including Guatemala and El Salvador, and negative impacts to maize are being reported. Next, please. In terms of the next several months, some forecasts are indicating increased chances of below normal conditions in parts of Central America and Northern South America that are consistent with El Nino conditions. The models are indicating somewhat less agreement in Northern areas, and potentially this is due to a near normal hurricane season being forecast in the Atlantic associated with warmer than average temperatures there. Next, please. In Central America, Northern South America, temperatures were much hotter than normal in June 2023. And based on outcomes during moderate to strong El Ninos of the past, we would tend to see an increased frequency of higher maximum temperatures and higher evaporative demand. Next, please. In Southern Asia, the May to July season thus far has been characterized by uneven rainfall distribution. There was a late rainfall onset in central India and Thailand, which delayed rice planting. There is extreme rainfall in northern India, which also made it difficult to establish crops. In the last month, rainfall improved, especially in central India, uh, bringing uh, accumulations to near average. However, the distribution is still a concern. Then in Thailand, low soil moisture and above average temperatures have persisted. Next, please. Historical outcomes of past moderate to strong El Nino events suggest, suggest increased chances of below normal rainfall for the next several months in India and Southeast Asia. This most frequently occurs in Central and Western India and near Indonesia. We also tend to get hotter summer temperatures and higher atmospheric demand. Next, please. According to the model forecasts, uh, it's, there's uncertainty for the next several months. There are mixed August to October rainfall conditions being forecast by the different modeling systems. However, these all indicate above normal temperatures being likely across Southern Asia. Next, please. In the region of Central Asia to Afghanistan, El Ninos tend to increase the chances of above normal precipitation uh, during many cases. In Afghanistan in particular, wet outcomes are often seen during moderate to strong events in the northern main cropping zones. Next, please. 
The current model forecasts are showing support for a typical El Nino teleconnection with increased chances of above normal October to December precipitation, as well as during December to February. Next, please. In East Africa, during the June to September season, we're looking at an average to below average outlook. This is based on observations to date, a two-week forecast, and historical rainfall outcomes during past moderate to strong El Ninos. The percent of normal outcomes from this outlook are shown in the map on the left. Independently, we're seeing dynamical model forecasts indicate below normal rainfall as most likely in parts of Western and Northern East Africa during the next several months in many of these teleconnection regions. Next, please. Compared to the last El Nino, which was in 2015, 2016, we are seeing better rainfall outcomes to date in Ethiopia. Uh, part of this is based on the uh, very wet conditions seen across East Africa in March to May 2023, as compared to 2015 here on the left and the right. Next slide. And then for the June to uh, July 20th rainfall to date, we're also seeing uh, less severe precipitation deficits in parts of central and northeastern Ethiopia, particularly compared to the very poor rainfall that was seen at this point in time during 2015, as shown on the right. Next slide. During East Africa's October to December season, we're expecting an active rainfall season, particularly in eastern East Africa. This tendency is associated with a forecast positive Indian Ocean dipole and expected El Nino conditions. Especially if the positive Indian Ocean dipole occurs, we're looking at chances of extreme rainfall with increased risks of flooding as well as infectious disease outbreaks. Next slide. In Southern Africa, Moderate to strong El Ninos tend to produce a hot spot of very below average October to February rainfall in Zimbabwe, Central and Southern Mozambique, parts of Zambia, as well as uh, South Africa. El Ninos as a whole tend to have a, a, a drying pattern across the region that varies by the month. And in moderate to strong El Ninos, we tend to see also higher maximum temperatures and higher evaporative demand. Next, please. Model forecasts are indicating some convergence for El Nino teleconnections. The October to December forecast is indicating potentially a dry start to the season in parts of the central and southeastern regions. And the NMME models for DJF, December to February, are also showing below normal precipitation from December to February in most parts of the region. And I haven't shown the temperature forecasts here, but they all the models are indicating above normal temperatures as being very likely across Africa. Next, please. In terms of considerations for this event and after this event, what we need to remember is that La Niñas often follow moderate to strong El Niños. This table is showing this, that this has occurred most of the time in the last cases, in the last 40 years. And this can produce sequential drought patterns. Um, in particular, this schematic is showing what that looks like in Africa, where you can get a dry season in June to September during El Nino in Ethiopia, followed by a dry season in October to February during that El Nino in Southern Africa. Then if a La Nina condition emerges, we tend to get a dry season in October to December in the Eastern Horn. And that can often turn into a dry season as well in the following year during March to May. So if a strong event develops, we should be on watch for a return to London conditions and those impacts. Weston, over to you. Thanks, Laura. Um, I think that was an excellent setup. I saw a quick question in the chat that I wanted to address. I saw it was addressed in the chat too, but when we say teleconnections, we're just referring to the way in which El Nino affects remote areas of the globe. So that just means um, an impact of El Nino in another location outside of the tropical Pacific. Next slide. So 
when I'm talking about uh, El Nino and crop yield teleconnections, what I'm referring to is the different ways that El Nino may affect crop yields or has typically affected crop yields over the globe. And we can think about that in two different ways. One is by this map on the right, which is a cartoon version of the expected impacts on maize, wheat, soy, rice, sorghum um, globally, showing that we have that a uh, similar reorganization of areas with above expected crop yields. Here we're measuring crop yields at the country scale, um, sampling El Nino events from 1960 to present. Um, and we're looking at deviations from a low frequency trend. So this is just uh, whether you're getting more higher yields than expected or lower yields than expected. And similar to precipitation, there's a reorganization of yield anomalies um, globally. But we can also consider this from the perspective of a global total yield, so just the yield impact on production. And the reason we might want to consider this is that um, we know that although El Nino reorganizes precipitation in a way that we understand, crop production is at times distributed globally very unevenly. And so while for many crops, wheat, sorghum, and maize, the areas of um, improved yield anomalies and deficit yields tend to balance one another out such that at a global scale, there's not a very strong influence of El Nino on global total yields, meaning major production regions uh, with deficits are somewhat balanced by major production regions with surpluses on average historically. Now, this isn't necessarily true for soybeans, where we expect global yields to be slightly above normal due to the teleconnections throughout the, Amer the Americas and the concentration of production in the US and Southeastern South America. And this isn't true for rice, given the concentration of production in Southern, Eastern, and Southeast Asia, and the negative yield anomalies that we associate with El Nino's in that region. Next slide. So when we're considering the teleconnections to each of these individual crops, here I'm showing essentially the same thing as that cartoon graphic, the country level yield anomalies, hatching indicates uh, no statistical significance. But I wanted to dive into these results a little more because we consider we can consider either the strength of the anomaly, here shown as a fractional yield anomaly, deviation from expectation. Next slide. Um, or we can also consider how robust that teleconnection is. And what I mean by that is, provided that an El Nino does develop, historically, how frequently have we seen teleconnections of the sign that we would expect, um, given that we have an El Nino? And basically all that means is, if we expect poor yields in Southeastern Africa during El Ninos, how frequently does that actually happen? So the regions shaded in darker green here mean that your El Nino teleconnection is more robust um, and more consistent. Whereas once we get down to about the white shading, your El Nino teleconnection uh, only occurs about 60% of the time. So even though we may expect a poor yield anomaly, that may only develop in about 60% of El Ninos, which is still useful information but may not be as strong of a tilt in the odds as in regions where we see a more robust teleconnection. Next slide. Now we can look at the full distribution of these expected crop yield teleconnections also. So what I'm showing here in these box plots is the um, full history of the number of El Nino events. Each El Nino is shown as a circle with the size of the circle proportional to the strength of the event. Each box plot is for country level crop yield anomalies in a different uh, country. And this is for uh, countries on the right and the region as a total on the left. And here I'm highlighting Southeastern Africa because this is one of the regions where we expect both to have very consistent and very strong teleconnections from El Nino. And here you can see that typical maize yield teleconnections in South Africa and Zimbabwe are both strongest and most consistent with anomalies of around um, 15 to 20% below normal. Although in some El Ninos, you do get above expected yield. So even in somewhere with exceptionally strong teleconnections, outcomes sort of counter to what our average expectation is are possible. Although we should be prepared for large country level and regional scale deficits. 
Next slide. Something that's a little more difficult to see on this global map, uh, as Laura was hi highlighting in Latin America and the Caribbean, there are also often negative maize yield anomalies, including in Venezuela, El Salvador, and the Dominican Republic. Now, there's some question about whether we should actually expect these to be more widespread spread or stronger due to data quality issues. But given the data available to us, we do expect below average yields in many of these countries and in the region as a whole. Next slide. And this is particularly of concern given the slow onset and dry anomalies in the region already that are already affecting the first maize cropping um, in that region. Next slide. Now we can consider wheat yield as well and similar to maize that you see these offsetting teleconnections in major production regions like uh, China, the US and Australia such that global scale anomalies aren't very strong. However, uh, one of the main differences from maize is that not many wheat yield teleconnections are very consistent, meaning that while we do expect El Nino to affect many of these wheat cropping regions, there's often a much larger spread in the expected outcomes. And we can see that in a region like North Africa and Morocco, for example, where the average impact is is quite large uh, at maybe 15%, but the spread in the potential outcomes is also very large. Uh, now, if we go to another region that may be of interest uh, in South and Central Asia, uh, that Laura highlighted as having typically above normal precipitation during El Nino's and a forecast for above normal precipitation this year, we do see that this translates into wheat yields in Afghanistan, for example, and above normal wheat yields. And while this is both irrigated and rain fed, we have split this out and looked at it. And we expect a stronger impact on rain fed wheat yields than on irrigated, although uh, the data that we have do indicate that there is some impact on irrigated wheat yields as well. Next slide. Now, rice yields uh, may be of particular concern here at a global scale and at a regional scale because rice production is so heavily concentrated in areas that tend to experience drought during El Nino's, like Laura highlighted. So in particular, we see negative yield outcomes in India and Thailand. And while they're not um, as strong in terms of percent deviations from normal, um, the, it, this is consistent across rice production regions such that global totals and regional totals are expected to be a, a few percent below normal if we're basing this on historical El Nino outcomes. Next slide. This year also provides some level of concern for rice because this top left pie chart here is the June geoglam uh, crop status uh, for major rice producers. And this yellow coloring in India and Thailand indicates that a delayed onset of the monsoon has led to concerns about the progression of the season, in particular, given the forecast for El Nino. And while current climate forecasts don't indicate um, that there will necessarily be a monsoon rain failure, you already see countries considering this and possibly reacting to it as India has imposed a uh, rice export ban on non-Basmati rice and is the, the largest exporter of rice in the world. This is um, potentially of concern if it becomes permanent uh, or hardens. Now, this is all um, based on historical events. And as Laura mentioned, the forecast for India is not for below normal precipitation at this moment, but it's something to be aware of that historically we have had below normal yields and there is some reason for concern in the, the situation early in the rice season already. So with that, um, I'll wrap up my presentation and hand it off to Benja to talk about some of the implications for acute food insecurity. Thank you, Weston. So next slide. So as many of you know, FuseNet utilizes the scenario development methodology where we set our scenario parameters for our most likely scenario. We then collect all available primary and secondary data to understand the, the current drivers of food insecurity and then classify the current and projected food security outcomes. Um, we then develop key assumptions for our most likely scenario and then use those assumptions to understand how they'll impact household income and food sources um, to then describe and classify uh, projected household food insecurity. So we then, once we have our um, 
most likely scenario, we then use the IPC 3.1 scale to classify area level foods, food insecurity outcomes. So on the left, you'll see a map showing Fusenet's June to September most likely outcomes for Fusenet's presence in remotely monitored countries. And you'll see Latin America and the Caribbean um, in the, up in the top left of the, of the map, and then um, Afghanistan, Yemen in, on the right, and then Burundi and Rwanda are uh, blown up in a bubble map so that they can be viewed more easily. So in this map, there are five phases, with uh, phase one being minimal uh, in green and phase five being catastrophe uh, in maroon. For an area to be classified in a phase, at least 20% of the population must be classified at that phase. In phase three, um, which is orange, households typically begin facing food consumption gaps or begin engaging in unsustainable coping strategies. For phase three and higher, humanitarian food assistance is needed to protect livelihoods and fill food consumption gaps. Also note that we denote an exclamation point in our mapping where the phase classification would likely be at least one phase worse without current or programmed assist humanitarian assistance. And in our remote monitoring countries, the country phase classification is determined by the worst area level classification within that country. So currently FuseNet's outlook period is June 2023 through January 2024. Regarding the, the level of concern for the impacts of El Nino on rainfall and therefore on sources of food and income related to agriculture, it is currently considered moderate to high in Eastern and Southern Africa and moderate in Latin America and the Caribbean. In East Africa, the level of concern is highest from June to September, particularly for two areas, uh, Western Central and Northern Ethiopia, and then the Sudans. I'll start with Western Central and Northern Ethiopia. So in contrast to the drought in pastoral Southern and Southeastern um, Ethiopia, rainfall in Western Central and Northern Ethiopia has been relatively favorable for the past few years. However, current forecasts for the June to September current rainy season indicates the likelihood of below average to average rainfall in Northern Central and Western Ethiopia, um, as, as was mentioned by Laura earlier in the, in the presentation. So FuseNet is closely monitoring the impact of this um, El Nino and the corresponding rainfall deficits and, and or patterns of rainfall distribution. So while it's not inevitable, there's also a concern for a potential drought, notably in central and southwestern Ethiopia. So a below average cremped rainy season would negatively affect both long cycle bell crops crops that are planted in the Belg and then harvested in the Meher, as well as short cycle Meher crops. So this would lead to both food and income deficits among crop and agricultural labor dependent households in these areas, as well as contribute to rising staple food prices across the country. So for the Sudans, monitoring the strength at which the El Nino continues to develop will also be important in Sudan and South Sudan. So FuseNet considers the level of concern moderate to high in these countries, given the impacts of existing uh, existing shocks that both these countries are facing. Sudan will already likely face below average production this year, given that the conflict is, has significantly impacted farmers' financial access to loans and inputs in areas of high productive potential, such as in the eastern states that utilize semi-mechanized um, and irrigated production. Additionally, increasing insecurity in many of the traditional rain-fed areas is impacting household ability to access fields for uh, cultivation. This is particularly uh, the case uh, for Greater Darfur and Greater Kordofan. An additional weather shock would further reduce production, significantly impact household income from decreased crop sales, aggravate already high prices given reduced shocks flowing to markets, uh, sorry, reduced stocks flowing to markets, and in the longer term, reduce food access as households will have significantly lower own produced stocks from a poor year. In South Sudan, while less rainfall is in some ways a good thing after four years of uh, heavy flooding, there is some concern due to already low levels of subsistence production in the country. Reductions in production outputs are likely to increase the country's cereal deficit and increase dependence on imports at the same time that production from Sudan is expected to drop consider considerably uh, both due to low production and to disruption of trade flows across the borders. So further price increases of staple foods would decrease financial access to food. In Latin America and the Caribbean, FuseNet's concern is related to erratic rainfall and above average temperatures on the current Primera crop production season in Central America 
and the printemp crop production season in Haiti. Um, through the end of the year, the combination of average to below average rainfall forecasts across the region and above average temperatures are expected to negatively impact non-irrigated crops for all upcoming cropping, uh, cropping seasons. Um, for uh, West Africa and Afghanistan and Yemen, the level of concern is considered low. For West Africa, El Nino is not shown to have a strong correlation with rainfall and current forecasts are for an average to above average rainy season in the Sahel. In Afghanistan, El Nino is associated with favorable precipitation, and in Yemen, weather has a relatively low impact on acute food insecurity, given the high reliance on imported food commodities. However, El Nino, uh, the El Nino would likely lead to a lower likelihood of flooding in rural crop producing areas. Uh, next slide. As we look uh, further into like the uh, most likely scenario outcomes for October 2023 through January 2024 period, in the Horn of Africa, the forecast of above average rainfall in October to December um, is largely viewed as favorable after the three years of drought on net. Past trends draw largely a correlation between above average rainfall and increased national crop production and enhanced conditions for livestock, uh, livestock reproduction. However, the degree of improvement will depend on the associated risk of flood flooding and the intensity of any flooding events which are difficult to predict at long lead times due to high variability in rainfall distribution, as well as the location of the flooding. The flooding, while typically localized, does often lead to livestock disease incidences, disruptions to trade flows due to flooded roads, as well as crop losses in the short term. Um, although at the same time, it does facilitate opportunities for recessional cultivation and more favorable pasture and water availability for livestock in the, in the subsequent dry season. In Southern Africa, close monitoring of the progress of the 2023-2024 rainy season, which typically begins around October, um, will also be critical as past trends, um, as highlighted by my, my colleagues, indicate El Nino typically brings below average rainfall to the area. So historically, the likelihood of below average rainfall is strongest in the region from December to March which is the peak of the rainy season as, and a critical period for moisture as crops enter the reproductive growth stages. So historically, there's typically at least a 60% chance that rainfall in the December to March period will likely be less than the 33rd percentile of average rainfall during an El Nino. But if we're looking at the October to January period, below average and erratic rainfall will likely lead to reduced planting as well as um, reduced access to agricultural labor income during the start of the lean season. Next slide. So as we look towards the long term and consider other events that could change the scenario, on the slide you'll see the period of highest concern that Fusnet has for Southern Africa regarding the impact of the El Nino on agricultural and livestock production. And this is likely going to take place from Feb February 2024 onwards, as February is around the time um, rainfall is is likely to be most impacted by El Nino, um, as well as crops reaching the, those water critical periods in their development. And uh, additionally, with anticipated declines in pasture. Uh, also, if below average rainfall does materialize, then Fusnet would expect the 2024 harvest, particularly for rain-fed agricultural areas in Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Angola, and Southern Malawi to be below average. So poor households in Southern Africa are typically able to withstand one bad rainfall season, However, the household coping capacity in these areas is limited due to the multiple weather shocks over the last six years. And the 2023 harvest was already below average in southern Mozambique, southern Zimbabwe, and southern Malawi. In October, FuseNet will be publishing the October 2023 to May 2024 Food Security Outlook Report, which will incorporate our ongoing analysis of the most likely scenario for the, this time period. And then in February 2024, uh, FuseNet will publish the food security reports that will cover February through September 2024. For Eastern Africa, the associated risk of flooding and the intensity of flooding events can impact agricultural production, as I mentioned earlier, and lead um, to outbreaks of livestock disease in incidences such as Rift Valley fever. Um, but again, these are difficult to predict at long lead times due to high variability in the distribution and location of the flooding. Um, and then in Latin America and the Caribbean, the combination of average to below average rainfall forecasts across the region 
and above average temperatures are expected to negatively impact the non-irrigated crops for the upcoming seasons, um, given that these countries have a higher proportion of rural populations and subsistence farmers and lower prevalence of irrigated fields relative to South America. Addition additionally, if a hurricane were to make landfall, that would further damage har harvest and livelihoods in the region. Um, with that, I'll thank everyone for your time and I'll hand it back to Jim for questions. All right. Thanks very much, Benja. And also great thanks to Andy and Laura and Weston. Um, we have had a few questions come in um, in the chat box. A 